la France. Of course, France has to commemorate Napoleon's bicentenary. Commemorate doesn't mean celebrate, but France has the right to remember one of the greatest leaders in history. It's important to present Napoleon's empire exactly as it was, and we especially need to represent the lives of the French and what it was like to live under the empire. Hello and welcome to a new edition. I'm Nadia Shabi, and this week you find us inside the military museum of the Invalides in the heart of Paris, the final resting place of one of France's most famous and controversial figures, Napoleon Bonaparte. As 2021 marks the bicentenary of the emperor's death, his political, military and social legacy have sparked quite a heated debate, both domestically and abroad. Let's start by sketching a quick portrait of this multifaceted leader. It's the incarnation of the French conqueror, an image often promoted by Napoleon's admirers. But they overlook the millions of deaths, between three and six and a half million according to estimates, that resulted from the expansionist wars he led. After taking power in a coup, Napoleon established a dictatorship. Although he gave France its first coherent legal framework, laying the foundations of modern French institutions, his 1802 civil code, also known as the Napoleonic Code, would roll back the clock for women after they'd managed to gain more rights in the first years of the revolution. A married woman suddenly found herself in a powerless position in society. In fact, she couldn't do anything without her husband's permission. She can't go to court without her husband's permission. She can't be a witness. She can't take an exam, get a passport. She can't work without her husband's permission. And moreover, when she does have his permission, it's him who gets the salary. So she doesn't have any more rights than a child. That same year, Napoleon re-established slavery, which had been abolished in France in 1794. Defenders of Napoleon's legacy explained that this was for economic reasons, arguing that the question of human rights didn't arise at the time. The 1802 law was actually discussed at the time, before the legislature and the tribune, and about a third of representatives spoke against the measure. So we can't say that everyone was in agreement. Several dozen lists of grievances had been drawn up in 1789, calling for the abolition of slavery. Despite this, Napoleon sent military expeditions to Guadeloupe and Saint-Domingue, where the local people had won their freedom. A bloody repression was carried out against the indigenous uprisings led by Louis Delgré and Toussaint Louverture. Meanwhile, in France, new racial measures were brought in. C'est la surveillance. It meant the surveillance of people of colour, and as far as possible, sending them back, which often meant sending them back to slavery. It also aimed to prevent mixed unions. Racial and racist laws, which ran counter to the philosophy of the Enlightenment that was spreading throughout Europe at the time. Villain, you'll be hard pressed here in France to find a neutral position on the subject of Napoleon. That's why, to get both sides of the debate, this week we've decided to put two guests to the imperial test. On the one side, Thierry Lance, who's the head of the Napoleon Foundation. On the other, Frédéric Régent, who's a professor and historian at the Sorbonne. Let's get going. First, if you were to describe Napoleon in just one sentence, what would it be? Well, I would say he's the most important historical figure in French history. Using just one word to describe Napoleon is hard, so I will use two, efficient and authoritative. Should France mark this bicentenary and how? France is marking his bicentenary with plenty of organizations having events to observe Napoleon's anniversary. But it's often a celebration of Napoleon, when there should be a historic focus and reflections about the period, to understand how the French lived back then. Uh, 
Of course, France has to commemorate Napoleon's bicentenary. Commemorate doesn't mean celebrate, but France has the right to remember one of the greatest leaders in history. His leadership was for the most part positive and lasting, even though there were also dark chapters. How else might France update the narrative around Napoleon Bonaparte? Napoleon's history is not set in stone. It never has been. The biographies about him written in the 1820s are very different from the ones written in the 2000s. So history is constantly being revised. There's no reason why aspects of Napoleon's history shouldn't be revisited. That being said, the new aspects that arise because contemporary sensibilities cannot hide the rest. We can't reduce such a major figure to modern issues. History is always being revised. That's why historians exist. They're supposed to revise texts. What I have seen in the bookstores, though, is that there are a lot of publications that celebrate Napoleon. It's important to present Napoleon's empire exactly as it was, and we especially need to represent the lives of the French and what it was like to live under the empire. Tell us about Napoleon's European legacy. Napoleon is now seen as a European figure. Of course, he's commemorated here in France, but he's also appreciated in other European countries. This is probably due to the fact that he represents our shared history, but also because there are traces of what he did in countries like Belgium and in parts of Germany, the Netherlands, Italy and even Spain. We can see that the reforms that were implemented by Napoleon and his army led to the abolition of feudalism. It led to the existence of secular states and it also led to social equality and good governance. Napoleon's European heritage is complex. On the one hand, some parts of French legislation were exported to other European countries. What you must remember is that other European countries considered Napoleon their enemy. So some countries don't celebrate Napoleon like we do here in France, like in Spain, for example. Is there a defining quote of Napoleon you'd like to share? Among the thousands of well-known and enduring quotes from Napoleon, the one I like the most is, impossible, that's not French. Of course, it's a little dated, but deep down, is impossible now French? There's a quote that for me highlights his opportunism. He said, it is by making myself Catholic that I brought an end to the war in Vendée. It's by making myself Muslim that I established myself in Egypt. If I governed the nation of Jews, I would rebuild the Temple of Solomon. In regards to slavery, Napoleon said, where slavery has been abolished, former slaves can remain free because we will need more soldiers to conserve the colonies. But in the places where there is still slavery, we will maintain it because the islands where it was maintained were more economically prosperous. Gentlemen, thank you very much. As you may know, the myth surrounding Napoleon's diminutive stature was actually crafted by a British cartoonist, James Gilray. And after unsuccessful attempts at having him censored, the emperor famously credited him with doing more damage to his reputation than any loss on the battlefield. So it's perhaps no surprise that the reality check regarding Napoleon's more unsavory legacy actually came from abroad with a series of articles in the American and British press. But as you're about to see, even outside France, the emperor still has his diehard fans. From Bristol, to Brussels, and on to Cape Town. Last year, numerous statues of colonialists and slave traders were pulled down or vandalized by Black Lives Matter protesters around the world. 
And yet, Napoleon Bonaparte, the man who restored slavery to France's Caribbean territories, still has a bunch of global fans, many of whom fight it out to get a piece of memorabilia. China is one of the fastest growing markets for Napoleon artifacts. Madame Lu is a collector who's come to examine the latest arrivals from Paris. We learn a lot about the French Revolution and Napoleon from history books. And most Chinese people know the famous phrase from Bonaparte, when China awakens, the whole world will tremble. In the nation that defeated Napoleon at Waterloo, the British historian and broadcaster Andrew Roberts believes the emperor deserves a certain amount of praise. Overall, of course, the French should celebrate Napoleon. Uh, he was an extraordinary figure, a protean figure, who changed Europe, changed the world, and certainly changed France. And uh, for them not to embrace this, uh, this truly extraordinary character, who also was a fabulous personality as well um, as being a great reformer, um, is a, a tremendous act of national self-harm. Not everyone agrees, though. Marlene Nadout is a professor at the University of Virginia. She's penned this opinion piece in the New York Times, titled Napoleon Isn't a Hero to Celebrate. For her, France's former leader is a tyrant and an icon of white supremacy, who committed atrocities in what's now Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Napoleon is the person who tried to commit genocide, whose troops tried to commit genocide in Saint-Domingue um, and who restored slavery. And to me, that's, that is him. It's, it's not a reduction. Actually, a man of his time, great man, um, you know, creator of the legacy of modern France is the reduction. Napoleon is the person who restored slavery. That was his choice. Reformer to be revered or despot to be deplored, the global jury is still out 200 years on in a world that continues to be rocked by racial injustice. And it's in front of the Empress Tomb that we leave this edition. Thank you for watching. Stay tuned to France 24.